Lord be with you. Well, hello and welcome to our talk from St. John's in Highbridge for this week. We're continuing and we're completing our series of talks on the Exodus story. And um, we've managed to do a video for most of these, um, but this is the last one anyway. So um, let's have a moment of prayer. Merciful God, teach us to be faithful in change and uncertainty, that trusting in your word and obeying your will, we may enter the unfailing joy of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So our reading today is Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 to 12, and also Matthew 22, 34 to 46. It used to be said that history is simply the story of great men. In the 19th century, Thomas Carlyle described the different eras of human history as dry, dead fuel waiting for the lightning out of heaven that shall kindle it. And the lightning that he described is these great men. Muhammad, Shakespeare, Luther, Johnson, Cromwell, Napoleon. It is men such as these imbued with natural genius who alone move history from one epoch to another. Ordinary folk like you and me, so the theory goes, well, we just sort of get swept along in their wake. So the great man theory, as it pertains to history and leadership, is not particularly fashionable these days. But for all its obvious problems, I sometimes wonder if there might just be an ounce of something in it. Today, we reach the end of the Exodus story, or one of its endings, you might say. This is the story, as I've said, that we've been journeying with over these last 10 weeks. Now, because I'm kind to you, we've skipped over Leviticus and Numbers, and we come now to the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And there's an obvious reason to stop here. The Exodus story is, in one sense, the story of a great man. Moses. In Deuteronomy 34, Moses dies, and we get his obituary, his valedictory. It seems to sort of boom off the page in rich wood-panelled tones. Moses is painted here very much in the colours of one of Carlyle's great men. And though of great age, it says, Moses apparently had 20-20 vision, had a six-pack and could walk a 10k before breakfast. He has untold supernatural powers at his command. And he was, we read, unequalled. Weep, weep, O Jerusalem, for we'll never see the likes of him again. But now I hear a questioning little voice. Will we not? What, never? And anyway... Is the story of Moses really quite so buffed and shining as his eulogy makes out? Well, let's remind ourselves of what we've read. Moses begins life, the exiled son of near destitute slave parents. Helpless and hopeless, he's destined for drowning. Until that is, his sister Miriam, inspired no doubt by the fearless resistance of the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, concocts a brilliant scheme to save her brother's life, and with a little help from Pharaoh's daughter, gets him a prime position in the royal household. We're already seeing that behind every great man there lies a string of resourceful women. So much for the theory. Now grown up, Moses commits murder. He flees to Midian, where again he's rescued by a woman, Zipporah, who becomes his wife. No mention of any of that in his eulogy. Moses' next encounter, though, is with the Lord, and we begin to see something looking more like conventional greatness. But this encounter at the burning bush, powerful and pivotal though it is, is more about intimacy and trust. God shares his dream with Moses, if you recall, and it's a beautiful one. Yet again, however, Moses elects not to follow his strong female forebears, but instead tries to wriggle out of being God's freedom fighter. He defers to his brother Aaron, who speaks for him because Moses is a stammerer. But Moses is nothing if not tenacious. He goes to Pharaoh, 
and after much persuasion, a whole lot of dead frogs and a horrific number of dead Egyptians, he finally succeeds in delivering his people. When Moses raises his staff, the waters part, the waters part, and through the reeds they go. Now, later episodes in Moses' life <clears throat> range from the inspirational to the merely puzzling. But for the most part, it's when Moses sticks close to God that he's on the right track. The Israelites, on the other hand, are as wavering as the reeds, as inconstant as the waves. They whinge, they whine, they worship a great big yellow cow, and they wander for 40 years, no less, before finally making it to the place we find Moses today, atop Mount Nebo, gazing down upon the promised land. With the wind of freedom in his hair, Moses can almost taste the richness of the milk and the sweetness of the honey. Except there's one last twist in the tale for Moses. The people are going to enter the promised land, but Moses won't be leading them. That privilege will be handed to his young successor, Joshua. After all that Moses has been through, he will not go. He will die in the land of Moab, and no one will know his grave. Let me pause there and ask you for a moment, if you were a novelist or a filmmaker and you were writing the great story of Exodus and of Moses and you'd constructed a portrait of this great leader and hero, how would you make this story end? Well, you'd have him lead them triumphantly over the Jordan, wouldn't you? And perhaps kneel down and kiss the ground in gratitude as the credits roll. That's what I'd do. You wouldn't have him die before the final consummation. You can imagine, can't you, the Hollywood studio execs chomping on their cigars and threatening to pull your funding. But oddly enough, in a story that's been full of oddities, that's just what happens. Moses will not go because God will not let him. Why? Well, it seems to stem from an incident in Numbers 20, one of those bits that we skipped. The Israelites are once again in the wilderness of Zin, complaining yet again that they have no water. So God tells Moses to speak to the rock and instruct it to bring forth water for the people. Sound familiar? Well, that's right. A very similar incident happened back in Exodus 17, except on this later occasion, Moses is chastised by God for lack of trust. He will not be the one to lead them into the promised land. What? Did he sin? What did he do wrong? Did I miss it? Well, within the Jewish tradition, much rabbinical ink has been spilt trying to work this one out. Most say it's because Moses struck the rock with his staff, like he did the first time back in Exodus 17, instead of speaking to it as the Lord had expressly commanded. But that would seem to suggest that Moses is being excluded on a mere technicality, as if the Lord were some kind of capricious nightclub bouncer saying, not tonight, mate. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs has suggested, quite convincingly, I think, that this episode simply marks a turning of the tide of leadership in the story of Israel. Moses' work is over. And it's time for the next great man to step up. After all, 40 years have passed since the Sea of Reeds, and the majority of the Israelites who could even remember Egypt firsthand have now died. It's their children who will take possession of the Promised Land. And that's, as they say, another story. Nevertheless, there's still something strange and inscrutable about the Lord's actions here. He affirms Moses, but denies him this final throw of the dice. It's almost as if God were keeping something in reserve, as if God had one more uh, card to play in the salvation story. Well, as it happens, God does. The final verdict on Moses' life, according to our reading in Deuteronomy, is this. Never since... Has there arisen a prophet in Israel 
whom the Lord knew face to face. Well, there's that little niggling voice again, speaking to me and telling me that you should never say never. Moses was unequaled in signs and wonders. But we know another who surpassed him. Moses delivered his people from slavery and led them to freedom in his time. But we know another who delivered all people from sin and who has conquered death for all time. Moses was a man who knew God intimately as friend and father. But we know another who not only knew God, but was with God and was God, the Word made flesh. I suppose you've figured it out by now. It's a curious but highly appropriate little fact that the leader who immediately followed Moses was called Joshua. Because Joshua, or Yeshua, is simply the Hebrew version of the Greek name Jesus. It means God saves. Moses draws out, but Jesus saves. So here's the significance of the Exodus story for us today. The way I see it, we can draw a line from Moses and the Exodus all the way to Jesus Christ. And from Jesus, straight through the heart of every human being. The great themes of the Exodus, liberation, trust, perseverance, hope, forgiveness. These are the great themes too of the human life of faith. This is not the faith of our contemporary society, which believes people can be whatever they want to be, simply by willing it to be so. It's not the faith of our contemporary politics, in which power means populism, sustained by lies and self-preservation. On the contrary, we cannot save ourselves, but we need a saviour. A Shifra, a Pua, a Miriam, a Moses, a Joshua, a Jesus, to stand up for us and lead us home. Fundamentally, I believe we need a saviour because human beings are made for one another and not to go it alone. The great man can do great things, but is nothing without great love. Human beings were made from love and for love. And when that love is tarnished and broken by the evil that we do and the evils that are done to us, human beings have no other choice but to climb down from that little idolatrous pedestal that we call me and my ego and descend instead into the winding streets of relatedness, humility, and grace. Attempting to be more than man, we become less, said the prophet William Blake, and he was right. The great promise of Christianity is that all the idolatrous, dehumanizing forces in this world are undone by the man who is God, Jesus Christ, through his life his death, his resurrection. When at last we put our trust in him, then we become free people, the beloved community, the redeemed, the children of God. This is our promised land, life with God, now and forever. So may the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. 
Amen.